Hi everyone, this is Ping Yu Chen from IBM Research. You are now watching the ECCV 2020 tutorial on uh, the Brazil robustness of deep learning models. I hope everyone is uh, staying healthy um, under these difficult uh, moments because of COVID-19. Uh, I'll start uh, to share my screen. So um, here is the outline of the tutorial. It will be divided uh, into two parts. Uh, we will start by introducing what is adversarial robustness uh, and show you uh, these uh, basic ideas and uh, uh, recent progress for adversarial attacks and its uh, applications to other machine learning uh, uh, problems. Uh, we will also um, talk about in the second part on defense and verification and conclude uh, the tutorial. Um, we, I will also share some resources that will be helpful for beginners to uh, uh, start working on this uh, research problem. And then we will have live Q and A's uh, as mentioned in the website. Um, so let me start by uh, saying what generation I'm, I'm, I'm actually you know, in. So you know, everybody nowadays, everybody likes to give tags, right? So if I were to tag, uh, give a tag to myself uh, in my research career, I would tag myself as uh, ImageNet generation. So you know, ImageNet has been uh, a very um, important data set uh, and uh, machine learning task to benchmark uh, different uh, uh, machine learning models and it has contributed greatly to the revolution of uh, uh, deep learning and uh, artificial intelligence. So it's, it is a, a large uh, scale data sets uh, that consists of millions of images and uh, thousands of classes and the challenges are is to do uh, object recognition and it's, it is once believed to be a very challenging task and a milestone to, uh, for uh, artificial intelligence. Um, so it's uh, been a, it has also been a, comp a competition for the past uh, uh, 10 years. So at the beginning, it is a very challenging task. So the error rate, uh, the best error rates over the years are like the above 25%. And we noticed a, a, a big uh, drop in the uh, test error uh, starting from uh, uh, 2012. So the improvements is actually uh, you know, uh, uh, start from uh, in introducing neural nets to, to this competition. So Jeffrey Hinton and, and uh, his uh, uh, team joined the competition in uh, 2012, and then they introduced uh, uh, neural nets into the competition for uh, object recognition, and that uh, greatly uh, reduces the, the, uh, the accuracy and improves the performance. So since then, you know, a lot of teams are ac actively uh, using and improving neural nets. And uh, most recently uh, on this uh, data set, right, people have discovered uh, now these machine learning models can perform a, a, a higher accuracy even than human, and that's uh, considered to be a significant uh, milestone and contributes to this uh, deep learning revolution uh, because of uh, uh, a sufficiently large label that has set a, a complex and a high capacity neural network uh, for uh, machine learning models to, to learn to solve the task and also sufficient uh, computing resources, uh, sufficient GPUs to support uh, the training of large scale models. So uh, as one of the pioneers in deep learning, uh, Yang Lakun once said, deep, deep learning is not an algorithm. It's, it's merely the concept of building a machine by assembling a uh, parameterized of functional blocks and training them with some sort of gradient-based optimization method. So this is how uh, general and flexible uh, this uh, uh, deep learning uh, technique can be. And that has been influenced uh, um, uh, many uh, research directions, uh, uh, including computer region. So I often make a joke like what happens when you do pretty well on uh, ImageNet. So in fact, you will win a Turing Award, which is the, uh, one of the highest uh, prestigious award in uh, computer science. So Yashua Benjo, Jeffrey Hinton, and Yang Lakun uh, are the winners of the 2018 uh, Turing Award uh, due to their contributions to uh, deep learning. Uh, but this is not the end of the whole story. We also need to uh, be uh, aware of some downsides, right? That, that kind of being uh, amplified by this deep learning technology. That and one of those uh, issues that has been uh, highlighted is this uh, adversarial examples. So as you can see, if we take one model and then we give this model ostrich image, the model will say it's ostrich, right? With, with a high confidence. 
But now, if you look at the, the three images on the right, uh, which are like slightly modified images, and then the modification is so small that uh, uh, as a human, you cannot notice the difference. But somehow, the modification, the small changes has been captured by the machine learning model, and you, it can pr uh, produce a, a wrong labels such as a safe, shoe shop, and vacuum. Uh, so that indicates uh, there is uh, something wrong going on with this uh, current uh, deep learning model. And just to be fair, uh, this model right, is not some arbitrary model. It's, it is actually one of the best image classifiers uh, uh, in from the ImageNet uh, competitions over the years. And also, uh, to be fair, images and neural networks are not the only victims. So these adversarial examples exist in a more general form. Uh, it can exist in other data modalities like text, like audio, uh, like time series, you name it, and other machine learning models uh, um, uh, other than deep neural ne networks are still uh, could be vulnerable to uh, this type of adversarial examples. So I will view it as a, a kind of a universal challenge for all um, machine learning problems. Um, so one thing that we observed in the past and is kind of surprising is that uh, high accuracy does not uh, guarantee good adversarial robustness. So one experiment we did uh, in the past, uh, also at ECCV uh, two years ago, is that we take uh, 18 different image models developed over the year, and then we rank them by their top one uh, accuracy, the standard accuracy, and then we also compare uh, how easy it is to manipulate uh, the, the outcome of the machine learning model by uh, adding perturbations to the inputs, uh, and that will be uh, proportional to the robustness level. And then so something we realize is that the more accurate model, those models that give you higher top one accuracy is actually easier or, or uh, more sensitive uh, to these adversarial perturbations. So high accuracy by no means guarantees good uh, um, robustness to input perturbations. And that also suggests that by looking at accuracy alone may not be give you a comprehensive understanding of the machine learning performance when you actually require uh, reliability and stability for your model prediction. Um, so I often uh, relate these adversarial examples to these evil double gainers, which basically the adversarial examples are look similar uh, or even totally the same as uh, this. Uh, um, a normal or realistic data sample, but somehow uh, their presence uh, provides uh, some confusion right, to the model and then cause, uh, may cause some harms. And that's uh, basically what uh, evil double gainer uh, means in these uh, superhero movies. So why do we care about adversarial robustness? So a, more, a lot of times we care about it is it, it is kind of an attack that happens uh, at the, the deployment phase when we train the model and then we want to deploy the model uh, in the field uh, for real world applications. Uh, but somehow this uh, lacking adversarial robustness uh, the, basically means it being sensitive to uh, manipulations uh, and causing a prediction, evasive predictions uh, will cause a lot of concerns, especially uh, concerns in trust or high safety critical uh, missions. Uh, uh, so the trust means uh, if the, uh, the users realize the machines are going to make inconsistent decision and perception and humans, uh, they wouldn't be able to uh, use the AI technology uh, in a trustworthy manner. And also, if we rely on these machines uh, to do high stakes or safety critical missions, we really want you know, high safety and high reliability, right? Uh, so the, 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 uh, the news that we saw often like the misclassifying a stop sign as a speed limit or uh, misclassify some dots uh, in, the, in the driving lane and will uh, uh, be misguided to an opposite lane will be often the concerns for lacking uh, adversarial robustness. And if you are a core machine learning researcher, you will be curious in terms of uh, what's the reason why my model can get 99% test accuracy, but somehow it is still very vulnerable, right? It can still fail to um, uh, correctly classify those adversarial ostrich images. So that means there must be some limitation or uh, blind spots in terms of the current machine learning model and the training methods. And for an enterprise perspective, right, we really care a lot about the loss in revenue or reputation. Uh, and it happens in real life. So for example, some company may put up an online interactive uh, machine learning service, but it can be uh, poisoned or misguided uh, uh, through the interactions of some users, right, either uh, unintentionally or intentionally. Then this, uh, machine, uh, this machine may be 
know, uh, doing some unethical decisions or uh, breaking rules or so on, and that would hurt the revenue and reputation. So studying this adversarial robustness is basically to infuse trust to those uh, machine learning uh, models and products and systems, and also to uh, prevent uh, these uh, uh, losses or, or risks. Uh, so uh, the robustness right, along with other uh, topics are like part of this uh, trustworthy AI uh, theme that is uh, emerging in uh, AI research, uh, including computer vision. So uh, you, you can see uh, in recent years, there's exponential growth uh, in terms of uh, these trustworthy AI related topics like fairness and adversarial robustness. Um, so this is a very active uh, research area and that, that uh, not only researchers care about this topic, a, a lot of general audience are also uh, would like to know what are the the uh, the, uh, the uh, guarantees or what are the um, progress we uh, we are making to make the AI trustworthy. Um, so for IBM research, our team uh, has a lot of uh, uh, visibility and the portfolio in this uh, search space. So um, in the past few years, we have published more than thirty papers at these uh, top AI conferences, and then we have been. Uh, leading uh, and uh, uh, the, the discussion and uh, driving the uh, directions for uh, improving adversarial robustness and evaluating adversarial robustness uh, f uh, in the enterprise uh, level. Uh, we also release some open source libraries and uh, tutorials um, uh, to um, uh, make a close interaction with our research community. Um, and as I mentioned, this is not only a topic that is of uh, great interest to researchers. Uh, general audience also uh, shares a lot of concerns about uh, the stories when this AI uh, technology cannot be trusted and how can we make the model uh, trustworthy. So we also have a lot of uh, news coverage uh, in terms of the, our research uh, outputs. Uh, so. Here is a high level of these uh, topics versus the research skill sets that I deemed important to, to um, toward making AI trustworthy. So we will uh, cover them uh, in, in this tutorial. And these this are the uh, techniques uh, that will be used uh, to study uh, this problem. So as you can see, this is a very uh, diverse uh, and uh, emerging and just like rapidly changing uh, research area. So um, you, your skill will certainly be uh, useful to contribute to the research in adversarial robustness. Um, so let us start by uh, giving a kind of a pessimistic uh, conclusion, right? So um, why do researchers and society care about robustness? Right? It's really you know, deep down to the heart. It's about the trust. How can I trust the AI models or not? Um, but one thing that we realized over the years is that uh, when, whenever there is a neural net, there is a way to generate adversarial examples. And I, we will tell you why it is so easy to generate adversarial examples. Um, so uh, let me do a quick recap by saying uh, we, we do care about this uh, um, uh, robustness in this AI technology, right? especially for autonomous driving cars, where the uh, driving cars has to be uh, provide uh, sufficient guarantees in terms of uh, the, the ability to correctly classify a, a stop sign, so uh, it wouldn't uh, cause any harm to uh, accidents. It has to be has the ability to recognize the passengers and so on. Um, and I'm also going to show some other Brazil examples in different domains right, other than these uh, safety uh, problems. So it's a, it's a general concern, right? So, uh, and as we know, like um, deep neural networks or deep learning has been actively used in, in different uh, tasks and different modalities like we listed here. And I would, uh, I would say for uh, uh, every um, data, uh, data set, uh, data modality, and every task, right? Is, it, it is, there is a fundamental way uh, to generate these other results examples and study the, the robustness. And uh, I will show some examples uh, uh, in the following slides. So the first uh, example will be image captioning, wh where the original task is to uh, uh, generate a caption that describes uh, the input image. Um, so as you can see, uh, this uh, the image on the top here, the stop sign, right? The the the, the top three most probable uh, captions are pretty accurate. It will say something like a red stop sign sitting on the side of a road. However, uh, we are able to generate an adversarial example that like looks totally the same as the original image, but the caption will be totally uh, wrong or nonsense. So it will say a, a brown teddy bear laying on top of a bed 
then we can even uh, make these uh, captions uh, generated at our desire. Um, so this is one example. Uh, the other example uh, will be this uh, audio adversal uh, examples where you are adding some perturbations to the input audio file and uh, will try to manipulate or change the outcome of the transcribed the results. Um, let me play the original video first. Without the data set, the article is useless. And here is the adversarial version. Without the data set, the article is useless. So we do hear some uh, level of noise, but we actually don't know what the um, uh, changes the output could be. So the, the actual um, targeted output is actually uh, OK Google browse to evil.com. So this is one uh, kind of a proof of concept of this uh, hidden voice command where um, for human, you will hear very similar uh, audios, but for machines, you will pick up uh, a, a different message and then maybe uh, start to browse to uh, other um, domains or take actions uh, without your notice. Uh, so for data regression, we have kind of the same story. It is possible to inject some data uh, to the training data such that, that when you do feature identification or when you do this regression analysis, uh, the, out, the outcome may be uh, misleaded or you, you may um, uh, mis misidentify some features as important, whereas they are truly like uh, not contributing to the actual output. Um, for text classification, we can do a very similar uh, thing uh, through this uh, paraphrasing. So for, for uh, paraphrasing, it's basically saying, are we able to find uh, a paraphrased, paraphrased version of the same uh, article uh, such that the semantic meaning still uh, remains similar to the original one, but somehow the paraphrasing will make uh, this uh, machine uh, learning model uh, misclassified. Mis uh, so in this, in this case, uh, we can uh, only need to um, re paraphrase either the a few sentences or a few words uh, in order to change uh, the sentiment uh, classification or uh, uh, to uh, uh, evade the detection of a spent uh, filtering. Uh, we can do similar things to, to for sequence to sequence models, right? So it's basically more generally, this is uh, other personal examples for translation tasks where uh, you can embed some um, keywords in the source uh, sentence such that the, the translated uh, uh, sequence right, will, um, will, will output something that uh, you, you want it to be appear uh, in, the, in, the trans, uh, in the translated outcome. Uh, and finally, uh, for graph neural networks, we, we observed a similar story where you can change either the features on the nodes or you can uh, perturb uh, uh, the edges by adding or uh, removing a few edges. And by doing very small changes to the graph neural network, you will observe a significant drop uh, in terms of the, uh, the amount of performance. Um, also, this is an example of a deep uh, uh, reinforcement learning where you can inject some noise again to uh, the uh, obser observation states. Um, and then that uh, uh, noisy observation will affect uh, the decision making of your reinforcement learning agent. Um, so, so far we talk about adversarial examples happening in uh, the digital space, uh, but I also want to highlight that, that the adversarial examples can happen in the physical world as well. So researchers uh, have done uh, this uh, uh, real world uh, physical adversarial examples like uh, adversarial stop signs, uh, adversarial 3D printed uh, turtles that will be misclassified as uh, some other objects or uh, adversarial physical adversarial patch that will draw the attention of your machine learning model and kind of uh, ignores other objects or uh, adversarial eyeglasses that can uh, uh, fool a face uh, recognition system. Uh, I also want to show a demo of our re more, most recent work. This is a physical adversarial t-shirt that takes into account uh, this uh, uh, non-rigid uh, um, uh, transformations and wrinkles uh, of uh, physical objects, uh, uh, so it's like, like a t-shirt. And this is uh, all, our work that published at the uh, uh, ECCV this year. So you know, feel free to um, go to our uh, presentation and know more details. So let me show the, the adversarial t-shirt um, um, video. So you can see uh, um, in most of the frames, a person wearing our design adversarial t-shirt can evade a real-time person identificator, uh, whereas the, the other person is not wearing the t-shirt will always be detected as a person. Uh, this is also shows this pattern will create um, um, some uh, 
vulnerability or a blind spot for the, these uh, uh, well-known um, person uh, identification models. Okay, so uh, after showing you a few examples of how these adversarial attacks can happen on different uh, applications, different data sets, uh, and different uh, uh, tasks, now we are going to talk about uh, how to generate those adversarial examples and how practical are those adversarial attacks. Um, so before I dive into those details, I want to give you a holistic view of this adversarial robustness. So if we think about the, this uh, um, AI um, technology as a, a life cycle, right? a pipeline of generating this uh, AI technology, right? So it starts uh, by collecting data and then deciding models, uh, machine learning models to train on those data. And those two data collection and model training uh, module will constitute the training phase of an AI life cycle. And then once we train our model, we will deploy our model and that goes to the test phase where you're going to deploy your model uh, uh, for business or for as a service. Uh, and depending on how you deploy or release your model, it can be a black box model that provides inference functions through an API or a, 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 a non-open source environment, or you can release your model in a transparent way that you release the trained model weights uh, to, to, uh, to the society. So it can be a black box model or a white box model. So by looking at those AI life cycles, um, we, can, we can determine uh, what kind of uh, attacks that, uh, that can be addressed, right? Uh, then that attacks basically depending on uh, what kind, uh, where in this AI life cycle an attacker or an adversary, right, can uh, play a role and uh, affect the, uh, the model training, right? So, uh, so for example, if you assume your um, adversary can has the ability to poison uh, your data or inject uh, data samples to your training data, like through crowdsourcing, then it could be a training time attack. Uh, if you only assume that the attacker has the ability to access the deployed model, but not affecting the training phase, that will be a test time attack. So depending on different assumptions and different uh, access rights of the attacker, you can, uh, we can consider different types of uh, uh, robustness um, uh, 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 topics and directions. And I also want to highlight, so uh, for training a time attack and test time attacks, most of the time we are, we are, are targeting about the learning performance of a machine learning model. So it's different uh, uh, from uh, um, uh, typical security research that mainly focus on um, a secure computation or secure uh, model data transmission and exchange. Um, and, but uh, this adversarial uh, robustness, of course, covers uh, this uh, has some overlap with the uh, security research in terms of uh, um, some joint interests, such as uh, can we can I, can we steal a model from a black box environment? Um, can we do some member membership inference or um, training data recovery from a black box model? Or, or how reliable are we uh, in terms of uh, deploying a model uh, for business through a third party that will be uh, something related to AI governance. So this is the holistic view of uh, adversarial robustness in the uh, research community. Um, so let us uh, start by giving you some taxonomy of uh, this evasion attacks, right, which is the uh, attack that happens at the test time. So again, depending on the model you are targeting, is a, is a white box or a black box, right? You will, you will be divided in terms of the the uh, uh, transparency of the model. And for the white box model, you can also consider uh, whether uh, the defense, additional defense added to the model, is known to an attacker or not. Uh, usually, we evaluate uh, this uh, white box rob uh, robustness as a red hat team, right? as a internally to evaluate our robustness is, is through this ad adaptive white box attack. Right? So a defense uh, is, uh, uh, is uh, certainly uh, uh, effective uh, unless the attacker knows that uh, the defense you are using but still cannot break it. Uh, that's kind of the goal, the standard, and the, the ultimate goal that a good defense uh, should stand. Um, in terms of a practical robustness evaluation, right? If you are evaluating your robustness uh, from a, a, a user's perspective, you will be more interested in a black box uh, attack setting where the attacker did not know what is the tar the detail of the target model, but it can observe uh, some side information like the predictions of a, of a given uh, model queries, 
um, and, and also depending on how many information you can get, are you able to get the prediction confidence along with the predicted labels, or are you only able to get the predicted labels uh, of the target system? Uh, in some cases, it might be easier to do a transfer attack of, uh, to a black box model in the sense that I can train uh, a surrogate white box model and run white box attack on my surrogate model and then uh, finally transfer my uh, adversarial example to the target model. Uh, and you can consider other types of uh, um, uh, attack threat models as well. So how do we generate adversarial examples, right? So in, in, imagine this uh, um, deep, uh, deep learning uh, platform. So we have like a TensorFlow, like uh, um, PyTorch and others. So for a white box attack, uh, where the models are totally transparent to an attacker, so generating these adversarial examples are actually pretty easy. So for example, if we want to make an adversarial bulldog uh, to make a, a adversarial uh, version of the, this bulldog image, so all we need to do is use the great uh, backpropagation. So it's a backpropagation from the out model output all the way to the model input. Basically saying if we, we want to generate an adversarial bulldog, like ha having the uh, high confidence in classifying it as a bagel, what is the, the, the right direction or the right manipulation actions to modifications need to make to the uh, original image such that the confidence of being predicted as a bagel will be high and the, the confidence of being French bulldog will be low. And that modification, you know, depending on what kind of uh, threat model you have, right, can, can be made as small as possible or as uh, in, in imperceptible as possible. So you basically, in, in terms of this uh, in implementation, it's just one line of code to generate this input uh, um, um, gradients uh, for guidance to, of generating adversarial examples. And that's why in principle, those different types of neural networks and different types of data modality and different tasks are you know, subject to these uh, adversarial examples. Um, so here I kind of give you a, a unified view of how this uh, attack formulation, the way to generate adversarial example uh, is being uh, formulated. So consider uh, this uh, design variable to be the perturbations to be added to the original bagel image. Um, so if you are uh, thinking about uh, this uh, uh, untargeted adversarial example where you want to add a perturbation such that you will, the, per, the perturbed image, image will not be classified um, as a bagel, right? So all you need to do uh, is to design some, look at some distance function and then you want to minimize the distance function between the original image x0 and the perturbed image x0 plus delta, subject to the constraint that the prediction of the original image will be different uh, from the um, perturbed image. Uh, and by solving this uh, appearance problem, we'll give you a feasible uh, adversarial um, perturbation delta. And there are different ways to, uh, uh, to, to, uh, um, to solve this adversarial perturbation. So you can use a Lagrangian uh, approach uh, by bringing this uh, um, prediction constraint, uh, different prediction constraint into uh, uh, the objective function. Or you can, you can try to minimize these uh, attack loss uh, subject to some uh, fixed uh, uh, distance budget. And different types of uh, attack formulation will correspond to different types of uh, these attack algorithms. Um, so the, the really the difficult uh, or um, the different uh, uh, thing happening in the, all these different attacks is how you design this loss function uh, related to misclassification and how do you design the right distance for the machine learning task. So for images, we often use this LP norm perturbations. Right? L, L, L infinity norms basically shows the maximum perturbation allowed in each uh, input dimension, uh, each pixel values. Uh, you can also use L0 norms that will be the counting the number of the pixel changes, uh, L, L1 norms and L2 norms and so on. So with this uh, um, uh, principle, the attack formulation in mind, uh, you can apply this principle to different types of uh, machine learning data and different types of machine learning applications. Um, so here I'm showing you some examples of these uh, targeted uh, adversarial attacks. Uh, where the, the uh, diagonal uh, images are the original image and off diagonal images are the uh, uh, targeted adversarial examples. So for example, this image will be classified as a one, this one classified as a two and so on. Um, so you can see that the, uh, 
these uh, perturbations are only visible for these uh, black and white uh, data sets like MNIST, uh, a handwritten digit uh, classification task. If you go to colorful images like CIFAR or ImageNet, uh, these perturbations are, are like uh, imperceptible to human. So you can, we can also extend this uh, um, adversarial attack to a universal fashion. Universal means uh, instead of uh, adding a perturbation to each single data sample, we can consider universal perturbation to different data samples. Like one universal perturbation can suffice to um, misclassify different uh, data inputs right, when it, it is being added right, simultaneously. Or you can consider universal perturbation to different uh, models when you do ensemble learning. Or you can do a, a find a universal perturbation when to these different input transformations such that this uh, attack is more robust to any image preprocessing. Uh, we also have some works uh, talk about what is the, a, a better way, basically using robust optimization uh, to find a, a stronger universal perturbation. Okay, so that's uh, what we discussed is the, this uh, white box attack where these models are transparent to an uh, attacker. Uh, but as a practitioner, you may argue in practice that this uh, attacker will not uh, have access to our gradients if our model is uh, a black box or implemented in a black box environment, like through an online API, where I just prohibit the, the function of providing input gradient uh, to a regular user. So there's no way uh, a user can use this input gradient to find adversarial examples against my model. Uh, so all the gradient-based uh, attack will be uh, in vain or not infeasible. Uh, so the interesting question is, in this practical setting, can one still generate adversarial examples? Is this still uh, a practical you know, uh, attack uh, uh, or not? Uh, the answer is unfortunately yes, right? So even if we are considering attacking a machine learning system with limited access, uh, where the model is unknown to an attacker, but it, it will provide some level of information because this is still a, a machine learning as a service scenario. So just using this a very limited information, basically the prediction of a given input without knowing why is the model uh, behind the service. So for example, it can be a neural net, it can be a decision tree, or it can even be a, like a rule-based systems. Uh, even though this uh, system is a blah blah spot model, all we need to know is use those uh, model queries. Uh, the, the model outputs are those uh, queries, the data inputs, uh, they are sufficient uh, as an, for an attacker to generate um, adversarial examples. So um, one of uh, the first papers is, uh, is actually published by our group is uh, the notion of using uh, zero order optimization uh, to generate these black box adversarial uh, examples. Uh, so so uh, re recall that we need this input gradient uh, to generate adversarial examples. So in our black box setting, because the input gradient is infeasible to obtain, so we are using the function values uh, to query uh, the function values at nearby points and then to estimate a gradient instead of using the true gradient. And this gradient estimation is very you know, similar to this uh, uh, slope, uh, um, uh, like a finite difference uh, method for uh, slope evaluation in each dimension. So by simply doing so, we can make this uh, black box attack possible to generate this uh, adversarial perturbation and find those adversarial uh, bagel images uh, through this uh, uh, iterative model querying. Um, so a bunch of uh, MIT students uh, uh, implemented uh, this uh, resource order optimization based attack and then showed that it is possible, indeed possible, to find adversarial examples on the uh, 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 Google Cloud Vision service. So you can see this is an adversarial image that will uh, uh, predict uh, there is a dog with 91% uh, confidence, but in the image there is actually not a dog happening uh, in, in, in the image. Um, so we didn't stop here. So we have a follow-up works that try to make this uh, black box attack uh, more practical and more query efficient, right? Because uh, the less query uh, you, you require to generate the best example means uh, the, the system are like, uh, uh, can be like uh, more vulnerable and easily uh, broken at the test time right, in a practical scenario. Um, so 
the follow-up paper that we have is called auto zoom where we use uh, some dimension reduction technique to reduce the, the number of design variables for these uh, adversarial perturbations and then we also introduce more advanced uh, gradient um, uh, estimation method to reduce the number of queries so as you can see, uh, comparing to the original paper, Zoo paper, uh, we can reduce uh, the query uh, uh, reduction complexity by more than 80%, an 80 to uh, 90%, uh, while still maintaining a good uh, adversarial uh, attack effectiveness, still able to find these adversarial uh, examples. Um, so here are more results in terms of uh, this, uh, how, this, how um, uh, the speed up we observe uh, in, in, in terms of doing dimension reductions through auto zoom. Uh, in, in average, we, we can reduce the number of queries by more than 99%. And now we can even consider a more restrictive setting where uh, the model only outputs the, the final uh, predicted label, but it does not provide the confidence scores. So in this case, we, we show that it is still possible to generate uh, uh, these uh, adversarial examples. So for example, this is the or, uh, original image of a safe. And now if we want to find the targeted adversarial example uh, and beam is classified as a car, so all we need is uh, starting from an arbitrary car image, and then we try to add the perturbations to that car image while making it uh, closer to the original safe image. So eventually, um, after some iterations, we will find an adversarial safe image that will be predicted as a car. Um, so even in this uh, very restrictive uh, uh, um, uh, scenario where only the decisions are given by the machine learning model, we can still generate uh, these adversarial examples. So this uh, black box attack is indeed a very uh, no practical um, issue that we need to address. Uh, I'm also going to talk about the applications and extensions uh, based on the adversarial attacks. Um, especially, I want to introduce a very uh, useful hammer called the zero order optimization uh, for handling blah blah attacks and other applications. <coughs> So we can uh, kind of uh, formulate uh, the problem of finding adversarial examples as a, as a finite sum problem where the, the loss, this uh, objective function is our designed loss function. So in a white box setting, solving the attack objective function is pretty easy. You just run uh, some version of the gradient descent algorithms and it will give you a solution that leads to a, a feasible perturbation. So in a black box setting, because we don't have access to the gradients, all we need to use all we can use is the function values to run uh, this optimization. So what we are proposing is uh, this zeroth order optimization is doing is uh, still using gradient descent, but instead of the true gradient, we use the gradient estimate through this uh, um, uh, gradient estimation techniques like finite difference methods. Uh, of course, this uh, estimation will incur additional uh, error, like estimation error. So the important, uh, one important topic of this uh, line of work is to study whether those uh, um, gradient descent-like algorithms using function values will be converge or not, and if so, how fast will it converge? Um, so this is an illustration of this zeroth order optimization. So basically, it, it still has the, the flavor of gradient descent, uh, try to find a solution, but uh, uh, the, the descent direction can be noisier compared to is the first order version. And uh, many people showed that they, uh, these algorithms, uh, gradient descent-like algorithms using only function values, uh, they can still converge, but you may pay a price, uh, this, uh, like a polynomial order of the input dimension, uh, since you are not able to get to the gradient, but you have to use um, a gradient estimate for each coordinate. So you have uh, additional um, um, complexity of the input dimension D uh, in the convergence rate. So uh, uh, one, one the obvious trend that uh, has been observed in the blah blah attack setting is uh, a better uh, optimization algorithm. Uh, if you use a, develop a better blah blah uh, zero order optimization uh, algorithm to, to run a blah blah attack, it will usually gives you a better performance and, and in terms of queries, in terms of uh, attack success rate. Uh, to, to, to evaluate the, the practical robustness of your machine learning models. So 
over the years, people have been developing different uh, dual sorting optimization methods and uh, use uh, uh, black box attack as a way to demonstrate the uh, efficiency of the proposed uh, algorithms. Uh, very recently, we also uh, published a survey paper at the IEEE Signal Processing Magazine uh, to summarize uh, the recent advance in zero order optimization for signal processing and machine learning. So uh, if you're interested in this uh, direction, you know, feel free to uh, check out our paper. Um, so with this uh, big hammer in mind, now we can talk about these applications in extensions based on adversarial attacks. Uh, especially, I will talk about uh, the connection of adversarial examples to interpretability for machine learning models and also a new way of doing uh, transfer learning. So uh, if we design this adversarial attack uh, right, in a in a, in a more principled manner, right? it can actually be turned into a tool for uh, providing interpretation of the machine learning model's decision. And we all know deep learning model is a black box model. So these adversarial uh, perturbations can be a very useful tool to help us understand uh, why um, a machine uh, classifies an ostrich as an ostrich uh, in, uh, versus an unicycle, for example. So we can look at those uh, regions or those pixels that uh, will um, have a st uh, stronger influence uh, in terms of uh, uh, the prediction outcome of a unicycle versus ostrich. And that uh, uh, sensitivity analysis can be done through an interpretable adversarial perturbation. So we also proposed uh, some uh, more uh, effective and advanced uh, attack formulations targeting uh, interpretability so we can generate uh, sparse uh, and more interpretable perturbations. So to explain, so for example, why this ostrich right, by adding this perturbation will be classified as a unicycle, you know, because it, like visually the perturbation that we found is indeed very similar to the shape of a unicycle. And we can do it in a reverse way, like using the, the interpretability uh, metrics to improve uh, the virtual robustness, uh, which is uh, covered by our recent ICML uh, publication. Um, we can also use this idea of generating adversarial examples to, to find the contrastive explanations uh, to provide post hoc explanation of a, of a black box machine learning model. Um, this is an example of saying, how did you describe Steve? You will say it is a tall guy with long hair who does not wear glasses. So obviously does not wear glasses is a very important feature because that, that may, can be a distinction between another Steve that wears a, a glass who, and who is also a tall guy with long hair. Um, so generalizing this concept, we can uh, generate uh, a set uh, of uh, uh, explanations called the uh, pertinent positives and pertinent negatives uh, for a given uh, input to a given model. So pertinent positive basically shows the minimum, uh, minimally sufficient uh, um, uh, materials to be present to support original classification. And pertinent negative is something that is necessarily absent to prevent the change in the classification. Uh, so for example, uh, if a machine learning model uh, thinks this uh, handwritten digit is a three, uh, we will ask the, the try to generate ex explanation on, on the decision. Uh, then the uh, pertinent part of it will say uh, the part uh, highlighted in cyan color uh, will, will support the decision of uh, a three. While uh, because the, the bar he uh, highlighted in, in purple is missing, uh, um, to, and that's why these two uh, cyan and, and the uh, purple part together constitute the contrastive explanation of uh, uh, this digit being classified as a three. Uh, and if the, uh, the, the purple bar is added to the image, it will be classified as a five instead of a three. Uh, then we can also you know, extend this idea to like colorful images like a, a, a f uh, with attributes and use those attributes um, uh, to, to, to generate these uh, contrastive explanations. Uh, we also see some recent interesting applications of, of, of adversarial attacks. So for example, uh, how did you uh, more, uh, manipulate your uh, web page contents to evade or uh, uh, the, the detection of uh, ad block uh, um, services? Or how can you generate some adversarial stickers you know, to, uh, to check out a bottle of wine uh, with the price of a banana or so on? And that actually incurs some very interesting you know, ethical um, constraints in terms of who is responsible of these uh, uh, actions. 
Um, next, I'm going to show a very recent paper that we published at ICML also this year. Uh, it's actually uh, transfer learning. So we all know the typical way of doing transfer learning is to um, um, uh, start from a source model or a trend uh, on, a, on, a, on a, a general task and then fine tune part of the, uh, the source model with the target domain data. Uh, that's how typically transfer learning is done. Um, so uh, we, we took a different uh, uh, thinking and then a asking ourselves uh, what, what really makes uh, transfer learning working. So uh, the reason could be a, a, a better source model, right? That learns a better representation. And a better representation can, can be uh, easily uh, repurposed for transfer learning. Uh, but usually the best uh, model, resource model we get is actually a, a access limited model. For example, a commercial product uh, rather than a uh, a pre-trained and uh, publicly available uh, model. So the best source model could be a black box model. So in this case, uh, are we able to do transfer learning with these access limited models? Um, so the answer is yes, so, but we have to use a very different technique. So in this case, uh, because this is a black box model, so we are not able to fine tune uh, the source model because we actually don't have access to the, to the source model. Uh, instead, we can use some ideas from adversarial perturbation, um, try to reprogram um, this uh, source model into uh, doing new tasks uh, without changing the model weights. Uh, and so this is a typical example where uh, it, uh, we are asking ourselves, is it possible to reprogram an image net um, source model into doing new tasks, uh, especially for uh, domains that has limited uh, data, uh, like especially like uh, medical image domains. So this is a high level idea of how we uh, do this uh, um, adversarial reprogramming. So we have a black box uh, machine learning model to be reprogrammed and, and these are the output uh, source labels. Uh, so with this uh, target domain data, uh, we basically add uh, an universal adversarial perturbation to the target domain data by through these uh, frames. So the target domain image will be put in the uh, center and the framed images are uh, universal to uh, the input data and they are trainable parameters. Um, so that's how constitute uh, these uh, inputs. And the outputs uh, of the uh, program, reprogram model will be a, a mapping of the source uh, model, a source label to the target label. And while these um, um, uh, source model remains uh, intact, we didn't uh, change any part of the source model. So with all those uh, three components, uh, the uh, trainable adversarial, universal adversarial perturbation, uh, the, uh, the mapping function of the source and target uh, labels, and also uh, enable a, a training of the uh, input transformation through uh, black box uh, 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 attack principles like zero sort of optimization techniques, then we are able to enable uh, this uh, um, transfer learning with the black box models, which extends uh, the uh, capability of current transfer learning methods. So here is an example of how we do reprogram uh, ImageNet for uh, autism spectrum disorder classification, uh, where the target domain data will be um, the correlation graphs uh, between different brain regions. Um, so it's very uh, exciting to see with this uh, uh, simple technique, uh, we are able to achieve uh, very high accuracy, uh, even uh, better than state-of-the-art without uh, doing any uh, sophisticated uh, data augmentation and so on. Uh, we actually uh, take this uh, uh, data set and, and run the programming on an actual API, uh, custom vision API, and then we observe that it, it only cost uh, like uh, um, uh, 20 US dollars to get a, a good uh, uh, to, to already to uh, able to obtain a good model uh, for uh, autism spectrum disorder classification by reprogramming through this uh, uh, black box adversarial reprogramming technique. Okay, so now we are going to move to the next part where we introduce the adversarial defenses. Basically, how do we improve the robustness uh, of the uh, current machine learning models? Um, so uh, geometrically, uh, the way to understand uh, uh, these AI models is through these uh, classification decision boundaries. So we know neural networks are like complex uh, and nonlinear models. So you will try to learn uh, more complicated uh, 
um, decision boundaries compared to linear models. Um, so, well, so one way to explain these adversarial examples could be uh, the red lines are, are the learned decision boundaries based on the training data. And this red cross is the original bagel image. So it, intuitively, uh, the way to find adversarial example is basically to find uh, nearby points and then perturb uh, these uh, original point toward another uh, decision uh, region such that uh, the green point will be um, classified as a, a grand piano while uh, the grand piano is very close to the uh, original uh, point. Uh, so because they are very close, uh, they will look visually similar. And that's what uh, causes this uh, adversarial example. Uh, this uh, geometrical interpretation also helps us, uh, can help us to design some uh, robustness evaluation metrics. Uh, so for example, given a data sample and the uh, nearby decision boundaries, uh, we can uh, try to evaluate uh, the margin, the, the closest distance, uh, the distance to the closest decision boundary uh, as, a, as a major margin to evaluate uh, the robustness or the, the, the sensitivity of a given point uh, toward the um, a prediction change. Uh, but overall, learning this uh, robust model is still not an easy task, and there are multiple reasons. Uh, for example, this deep learning model can be a black box model lacking interpretation. Uh, the model architecture is not uh, may not be the, the, the best when you are thinking about making a robust and fair uh, AI model. Um, and, um, and some part of the training deep neural networks may be different from how the actual brain works. And, uh, uh, that, and that's one possible reason to cause these other bristle examples and so on. So all these are, are like valid uh, uh, points. Um, and one interesting thing is that this uh, uh, area of adversarial robustness is a very dynamic area. So we often see a new uh, defense is being proposed, but a few weeks later, it has been broken or surpassed uh, by a, a, a advanced attacks. So you will see papers like uh, uh, bypassing 10 different detection methods, um, uh, supplement, supplementing defenses to adversarial examples and so on. And eventually we are hoping with this uh, interactive uh, iterative approach, uh, we can reach a state where uh, we are able to find uh, a good defense methods and scalable uh, defense uh, methods that are, are resistant to uh, uh, strong attacks. Um, yeah, so this attack and defense is indeed an arm race. So we also show, see a lot of competitions held at the uh, conferences, uh, like New Rips, uh, try to bring two teams, like attack team and defense team together and to, to push uh, the, uh, the, the research agenda of the, this uh, adversarial robustness. And more generally, so beyond uh, this adversarial manipulation and so on, uh, robustness or adversarial robustness also uh, relates to the general notion of robustness that includes uh, a better generalization, right? So generalization to unseen data or generalization to uh, like difficult uh, images. Uh, some, some images here are, are being, uh, without any, any manipulation, are actually being misclassified um, by a uh, machine learning model. So, uh, so and, and this uh, now is being kind of being rephrased as a natural adversarial examples to test uh, the generalization and the robustness to this uh, more complex but natural um, data samples. Um, so I want to use one slide to summarize where we are in terms of defense and where we go. Um, so um, in many cases, we, the way we evaluate uh, the effectiveness of a defense uh, is uh, only when it is known to an adversary but still cannot break uh, the proposed defense. That is, uh, we, if you are claiming uh, some good uh, defense, you have, to, uh, you have to specify what types of uh, attacks that you are considering. So the most convincing case is the defense uh, against uh, adaptive white box attack. That means the defense is uh, transparent uh, to an attacker, but the attacker still uh, cannot find a way to break it. Uh, and in the past, there are many uh, methods proposed to improve robustness, like uh, data augmentation, input transformation, and correction, and so on. So all these methods has uh, some uh, performance enhancement, but uh, they has not been made significantly. Uh, the most uh, efficient, uh, effective method, I should say, is uh, robust training. 
uh, where instead of training a model with respect to the training loss, uh, it, it incurs a minimax training where the minimization is over the trend model weights uh, and the maximization is over the perturbation. So when you train your model, uh, you also manipulate the, the, the batch, each batch in your training data, uh, and then try to make sure the uh, manipulated, uh, the loss of the manipulated data can be minimized as well. Um, so this uh, method is effective, but, but the, the downside is, is not really scalable. And uh, sometimes uh, the robust models um, will observe a significant drop in test accuracy, uh, which is not desirable. Um, and, and there is, uh, seems to be a uh, intrinsic trade-off between robustness and uh, the test accuracy as well. Uh, of course, people are like very, this, this is a very active uh, research area, and so people are trying to use um, different ways to address uh, this problem. Um, so next, I, we, I'm going to uh, show you some uh, cases where the defenses are looks very, uh, very pr promising. Um, against uh, certain types of adversarial attacks, right? And for defenses, I will separate into two parts. That will be the detection and patching. So let's uh, start uh, from the de detection. So this is the case I show you these audio adversarial examples where the, the transcribed outputs will be different by adding adversarial perturbation. So without without the data, set, data set, the article is useless. useless. So we, we are proposing a way uh, to detect these adversarial attacks by comparing their temporal dependency. Um, so the way is uh, uh, you, you basically do, do, uh, do two passes of a, of a given audio input. So first you give, you give a full pass of the data input and you observe the full transcribed output. Uh, and then you cut down some part of the input audio and then compare uh, the corresponding output. Um, and then, and then uh, what's remaining is to compare the similarity between uh, the, 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 the same segment to see how similar the transcribed uh, sentences are. So intuitively, if the input is a normal um, uh, audio without any manipulation, then you will expect the, the transcribed segments to be similar. However, uh, if the audio uh, input is adversarial, then the transcribed sentence will be very different. So the similarity score will be low. Uh, so basically, you can, we can use it as a very efficient and, and uh, computationally affordable way uh, to, to, do, to uh, do this uh, detecting uh, whether input is adversarial or not. All you need to do is uh, paying an additional four pass uh, of, a given image, of a given audio input. And the detection performance uh, is actually pretty satisfying. But it, it heavily relies on the temporal dependency uh, of the uh, audio structure. Um, this is an, a, another example of a, a training uh, time attack, the backdoor attack, where uh, an adversary trains a neural network with uh, some uh, Trojan triggers, uh, like the green labels, and then you train a model with those Trojans. So without the, tro the triggers, the model will behave normally, but with the trigger, uh, any image will be classified as a speed limit. Uh, so the task here is really asking uh, uh, are we able to decide whether a given model has a backdoor, is being trojan or not, uh, without knowing the uh, training data? Um, so also uh, at the ECCV this year, we are um, presenting a paper called the practical detection of children models We're using limited data or even without using data. Um, so for the data limited case, we only require one sample per class uh, for for detecting a trend model is uh, has a backdoor or not. Uh, for data-free case, we only need to use uh, random uh, inputs uh, to do the detection. Uh, so the idea is uh, the backdoor, the data uh, model will have some uh, 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 spatial properties like a shortcut uh, because it, it, it will generate uh, um, uh, target, uh, targeted uh, predicted labels once the trigger is present at uh, the input. So what we do is we can compare the universal perturbation of uh, the, uh, the available uh, data set uh, versus uh, individual perturbations of each uh, uh, data sample and compare, again, compare their similarity. So if their uh, similarities are high, that means uh, there, there is uh, uh, some Trojan in the model. And if the similarity is low, uh, that means the model is, is, a, is a normal model. 
uh, in the data free case, uh, we can leverage uh, some activation maximization techniques, uh, leveraging the memorization effect of a neural network model to do this uh, detection. And our detection performance uh, uh, can achieve near perfect detection uh, uh, without any prior knowledge of uh, why is a good model, why is a, a, a backdoor model. Um, and we can also uh, use our tool uh, to uh, generate potential trigger patterns uh, for inspection. Um, and feel free to uh, go to our uh, poster for more details. And now I'm going to uh, talk about the other uh, part of the defense that is uh, patching or um, um, model repairing or model uh, um, uh, performance improvement and strengthening. Um, so uh, the, there are multiple ways that we can um, uh, strengthen a model, especially uh, you are given a, a trend-based model. How do we take that model and uh, add patch to it to make it robust to adversarial perturbation? So one of our proposal is to uh, add some uh, randomness to increase the, the attack cost uh, uh, to find adversarial examples. So we, are, we have a way of doing uh, hierarchical random switching by um, duplicating a trend um, uh, um, base model um, and then do a hierarchical switching to uh, uh, make the attacker uh, uh, the, the, to increase the, the, the attacker's cost and having a better trade-off in terms of uh, the, the, the drop in test accuracy versus the, the robustness against adversarial perturbations. Uh, we also uh, have proposed uh, different ways of, uh, uh, of a model strengthening, including uh, Sprout, which is a, a attack agnostic self-progressing a robust training method that uh, will ask a model to uh, identify the vulnerable uh, spots uh, during training and uh, being self-corrected. Uh, CAT is uh, also a similar uh, idea and that takes into account uh, this uh, data heterogeneity and the different uh, data margins into training so it can uh, uh, achieve a better trade-off between uh, robustness and the test accuracy. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to uh, tell uh, the details of these two uh, approaches, but uh, uh, you can find those papers online. Um, so for Sprouts, we do uh, observe a substantial robustness improvement. So here we are showing um, these, uh, the accuracies of the perturbed samples under different perturbation uh, trends. So larger means you are able to perturb uh, each image with a, a more noise. Uh, so uh, we, we can see that with this Sprout uh, approach that we proposed, uh, our model can be made more robust, uh, even for uh, large uh, perturbations. And then the learned um, uh, loss landscape is indeed more smooth, which means uh, the models are more uh, robust and, and being insensitive to input perturbations. Um, and I also want to highlight that the, this robustness should be a really a, like not a single object evaluation. It should be a like multi-objective uh, 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 object, right? So when we do this uh, sprout analysis, we always uh, tested the different uh, metrics like the invariance uh, or uh, robustness to different attacks on the, 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 uh, the test accuracy and so on. So you can see uh, sprout indeed gives uh, the best uh, performance uh, considering all the metrics together. Uh, similarly, we, when we consider this CAT customized adversarial training, uh, it can, uh, by taking into account uh, different margin for each uh, uh, training data, it can, it can uh, reach uh, very outstanding performance on a CIFAR-10 uh, robust models. Uh, now I'm going to switch gears to uh, backdoor attack. So again, backdoor attack is a very different, it's a training time attack where you are, uh, inject uh, some Trojan or backdoor to a trend model. So uh, without, without uh, the, this uh, trigger pattern as uh, this uh, square, a white square box, uh, the model will behave just like a standard model. But with the triggers uh, uh, being presented as the input, the model will output a, a, a targeted uh, uh, label. That's why it's called a Trojan attack. Uh, and uh, this year, we also um, introduced a, 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 more, um, a more powerful uh, backdoor attack on federated learning system called the distributed backdoor attack. So it turns out that if you are considering uh, training your machine learning models through federated learning, um, we, we can uh, 
uh, it is also at the same time gives uh, uh, some new vulnerabilities uh, to let uh, adversary launch a distributed attack and then to embed uh, um, backdoors uh, through different uh, um, uh, these uh, workers and 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 as a more efficient way to to uh, poison or to backdoor the the, the the final federated learning model, and because of the distributed nature of the attack, uh, this uh, uh, distributed attack is actually more effective and also stealthier and it's less less likely to be detected and it's also more resilient uh, to this uh, robust uh, robust uh, um, uh, aggregation techniques and so on. So. Um, we we talk about how do we detect uh, a model, a, a trend model is uh, is uh, has a backdoor or not. But the next interesting thing is if the model is detected with some trojan, are we able to repair the the model? Right. So this is the kind of a, a, a scenario that we are considering. So for example, I have an amazing image net model that gives us ninety five percent top one accuracy. Uh, and I'm, as a model developer, I'm willing to make it public available uh, by releasing the model architecture and, and weights, right? So uh, as a model developer, you will be very uh, attracted to use uh, your mod that, that model for fine tuning or for transfer learning or whatever for your own task. Uh, but the question is, uh, should we use it? If it's, uh, the model is released through some untrusted uh, resource, uh, and also especially when it is being detected to have some children. Um, so you will say, okay, it's very tempting, but um, I attended the, the uh, ECCB tutorial on the virtual robustness, um, and it makes me aware of the risk right, with, uh, with using these uh, untrusted models. Uh, but how, how do I know I can use the model safely and I wouldn't uh, um, introduce any you know, re additional risk or uh, trojans into my own task? Uh, the idea is actually pretty easy. We, so we can try to sanitize the model before using it. Uh, it's just like a, wearing a mask to protect yourself. Um, so by using sanitization, we can reduce the risk uh, of, uh, of uh, using a potentially um, uh, poisoned model, but still enjoy this uh, high prediction accuracy on the normal data. So the problem set up is really, are we able to do some sort of trusted fine tuning with limited data? Uh, basically, given a, a, a trend model from a trusted, uh, an untrusted source, uh, are we able to use a, a handful of uh, clean and trusted data sample to sanitize the model? Uh, basically, try to remove uh, the potential um, adversarial effect uh, while still guaranteeing similar performance on, on the, 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 the test accuracy or um, uh, regular task. Um, and I should mention that uh, this is only a more practical setting if the trusted data samples are only very limited. Otherwise, if you have a sufficient number of uh, trusted data, you might just train a model from scratch and uh, never use uh, this uh, uh, untrusted model. Um, so the idea we are using is uh, how do we do trusted fine tuning is uh, we are using some um, um, uh, recent techniques uh, from mode connectivity. Basically, it, it concerns how uh, different uh, uh, optimized model weights in the loss landscape are connected. Uh, so it turns out that you, can, you are actually able to, to describe the, uh, the connectivity of the different local minimums through a parameterized uh, uh, and simple um, uh, equations. And we can use that as a prior knowledge to search uh, for a better model. So better model here means uh, the model such that it, att it attains a similar performance on the task, but it reduces the risk of uh, uh, backdoors. Um, here are some details of the, the technique. So basically, once you're able to identify uh, how the, these uh, different uh, loss landscapes are, are connected, uh, the different local minimum are connected, and all you need to do is to search along this uh, um, uh, mode uh, curves uh, uh, in, in, to find a better model that gives you a uh, similar performance, uh, but uh, uh, far away from the two potentially uh, poisoned models such that uh, the model uh, will not uh, uh, inherit uh, adversarial effects. So comparing to different techniques uh, like uh, training from scratch or, or, or doing some fine tuning or, or doing pruning, 
uh, what we found is that uh, this uh, technique of trusted uh, fine tuning through mode connectivity indeed uh, has a better trade off between uh, attack performance versus clean accuracy. Right, right. So, for example, training from scratch can remove the backdoors, but it has a low clean accuracy, especially when the trusted data are limited. Um, pruning can remain high clean accuracy, but it still you know, it, uh, carries over the backdoor effect. Um, fine tuning is suboptimal, and uh, especially when the data size is not sufficient. Uh, so, um, so it, overall, the trusted fine tuning through this model connectivity um, seems to achieve a better trade off, and it's a very um, practical scenario, especially uh, when we want to use a, a untrusted, uh, no large scale um, uh, pre trained model, which we are not able to train uh, on a user side. Um, next, I'm going to move to another topic that is a robustness certification and evaluation. Um, so the certificate here means uh, for every uh, given data sample and every trend uh, uh, model theta, uh, we, are, we can provide uh, some level of robustness uh, guarantee in terms of that uh, no matter uh, how you perturb uh, your data sample uh, through a, a defined uh, um, a regime, uh, like LP ball perturbations, for example, you can guarantee that uh, this certificate epsilon guarantees that no matter how you perturb uh, your data sample, as long as it is uh, the perturbation is smaller than epsilon, then the uh, model prediction will not be altered. So it, it shows a, a, a stability guarantee of the model decision, not just to a given point X, but also to the neighborhood of the X uh, up to some di um, uh, uh, distance epsilon. So why do we care about verification, right? So this is really an argument between whether you want the empirical robustness or you want the verified robustness. So empirical robustness, uh, you, you can always run different types of attack to benchmark the robustness of your model. Uh, but the downside is that uh, this empirical approach may not guarantee uh, robustness to unseen or a stronger attacks. Uh, whereas a verification-based approach, this is an attack-independent approach, and it can it provides some certificate to ensure no attacks can uh, alter the decision of your model uh, uh, if the perturbation is within uh, the certificate certified range. Um, but of course, the downside is that the verification approach is computationally more, uh, more demanding, uh, and, and for like this a uh, large and deep neural networks, uh, it has some uh, computational issues. Um, so this is a visualization of uh, uh, this empirical versus certified robustness. So for empirical robustness, you can always uh, generate this adversarial ostrich of a given ostrich image and then use the, their distance uh, to evaluate uh, the robustness. Uh, on the other side, uh, for certified robustness, we are looking for a certified region, basically the green region such that uh, we can ensure no matter how the point is being perturbed, as long as the perturbed point is still within uh, this uh, green region, then the, the, the model pr uh, prediction will still be an ostrich. So this is, uh, um, so in terms of the maximum certified perturbation, this, uh, um, the, the, any uh, successful attack perturbation will be an upper bound of the maximum certifiable safe perturbation and any certified radius will be a lower bound of the maximum certifiable um, safe perturbation. Um, so we also uh, work on this problem uh, for a while in the past few years, and we uh, keep improving our techniques to, um, uh, to catch up with the, the recent uh, progress made in deep learning models, right? To make them, uh, the certification to a more generic, like incorporating convolutions in, uh, in considering general activations um, and, and so on. Um, so let, let me show you how intuitively how this uh, verification is done. So for example, if you want to certify a given uh, ostrich image X0, like how what is the epsilon range, the largest epsilon range that you can certify such that uh, the prediction will still be an uh, ostrich. So all we need to do is to propagate uh, this uh, a given epsilon from all the way from input to the output of the neural net. So after layers of uh, propagation of the lower bounds and upper bounds of each neuron, 
uh, until it hits the output. Uh, all we need to do is to compare the lower bound of the ostrich uh, to any other upper bound of the any other class. So as long as the lower bound of the ostrich is still higher than the upper bound of any other class, then we are confident that this uh, uh, epsilon perturbation will not change uh, uh, the prediction uh, of the uh, of, of the perturbed image, uh, as long as the perturbed range is within epsilon. And then we can make it an iterative process to find the largest epsilon to guarantee um, the, uh, the ostrich being the top one uh, predictive uh, class. Uh, we can also consider more general, general, generalized uh, activation functions. Uh, and, and to make this computation efficient uh, um, for certification, uh, we, we, uh, in practice, we do a lot of uh, linearization of the uh, activation functions so, such that uh, we can write the output of the neural network as a linear function uh, of the input through this uh, iterative uh, layer-wise propagation. Uh, we can also generalize this technique to uh, adapt convolutions to make the uh, certification more efficient. Um, and over the years, we have developed uh, different uh, certification tools for different uh, neural network components like uh, batch normalization, convolution layers, residual blocks, and pooling functions, and so on. Um, so uh, with this uh, improvement, we can make this certification uh, more general and also more efficient and also be uh, adaptive to the, uh, any new neural network architecture. Uh, we can also do uh, verification in the semantic space. So if you consider you know, semantic adversarial attacks that uh, are achieved by rotating an image, uh, change the color, you know, translate the translation of the uh, objects, uh, or, or change the brightness and contrast, and so on. Um, so this is a recent paper published at the CBPR this year. So what we can show is that with our certification technique, we can certify, so for example, uh, 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 a, a rotation uh, image uh, degree such that we can assure uh, the image is rotated below this degree will not uh, change the prediction. And the comparing to the, the, the degree search of uh, um, uh, degree rotations, our certified bound are indeed very close to uh, the, the rotated degrees that will incur the prediction change. So those uh, results are, are pretty promising in terms of uh, building up an attack agnostic approach to uh, provide a robustness certificate uh, against uh, the, the attack uh, adversarial um, manipulations. Um, we also have a way of, instead of doing verification, we also have a way of doing a better uh, evaluation uh, of the, the, the a distance to the of a given point to the closest decision boundary uh, is is a score called the Kleber score. So the larger the score means uh, the further distance uh, to the closest decision boundary, um, and we can use that as a way to indicate uh, um, whether the model has been made more robust uh, or not. Um, so as I mentioned, the, the one way to use this uh, attack and agnostic score is uh, when you try to you make your model robust by doing some modification of the original model. Uh, so one way you can use the Kleber score is to compute the Kleber score of the original model and then compare it with the Kleber score of the modified model. And, and so as a way to indicate uh, whether the model has been, uh, th these uh, changes you made to the original model are indeed uh, being effective uh, for improving robustness or not. Uh, we also showed uh, other use cases of our, our Clever and we built a, a, a cute uh, um, demo for how Clever can be used uh, to, um, to uh, suggest uh, uh, robustness uh, improvements and evaluations for different uh, handwritten digit uh, uh, check services. Um, so I would like to summarize and give some takeaways. Um, so the first thing is, uh, I believe uh, adversarial robustness is a new AI standard toward trustworthy machine learning. So we are really looking at uh, uh, developing a reliable and robust AI technology beyond you know, just being accurate on the test data. Um, and robustness uh, uh, does not come for free. Right? We know adversarial examples exist in digital space, in physical world, and in different uh, domains. Uh, so with that uh, notion of the, the adversary's exist, existence in mind, uh, we have to you know, uh, work hard and, and uh, address these issues. 
Um, and one thing I would like you to memorize is that high accuracy does not automatically guarantee good robustness. Uh, we should use other robust metrics other than accuracy um, for these uh, safety critical and uh, high stake decision making machine learning models. And there is always an arm race bet uh, between adversaries uh, that use AI to break the system and also uh, is, is using AI to design a, a more robust uh, uh, systems. Uh, we also talk about uh, ways to evaluate and improve other uh, model robustness, uh, including verification methods, uh, detection, and also uh, uh, patches to improve and strengthen models robustness. Um, but there are certainly more that we need to do uh, in, and also uh, do these things in a more uh, model agnostic approach and make uh, these uh, defenses more scalable and, and efficient. Uh, I often share uh, our latest research uh, um, results uh, on Twitter, so feel free to follow me to uh, understand what are the latest uh, results we put out uh, from our I IBM research group. Uh, I also want to share some resources uh, for uh, if you are interested in, in the working on this uh, uh, area. So there are Clever Hands, open sources like Clever Hands, uh, other virtual robust toolbox or Fullbox, and, and or also many others. Um, I want to um, uh, kind of uh, give a spotlight on art uh, because it's an open source uh, a product uh, made by IBM Research and includes different attacks and defenses and, uh, um, and also different uh, attack mitigation uh, techniques. Um, you can also feel free to read those uh, sample surveys uh, related to other virtual robustness. Uh, I think it, it, this will be a very good uh, entry point uh, for you to get familiarized with uh, this research area. Uh, and the Professor uh, Cho Rei She and I are also writing a book on adversarial machine learning and we plan to publish in the next year. Uh, finally, I would like to also uh, conclude with a bigger picture of a trusted AI. So, uh, uh, in IBM, we, be, we believe uh, infusing trust is, very, uh, is a next uh, very critical milestone uh, toward the next uh, generation of AI technology. So in addition to robustness, we, we also have a lot of um, uh, work on fairness and explainability and also transparency. So all those uh, four pillars are, cons are considered as uh, top priorities uh, to uh, make AI trustworthy. Uh, and very recently, we also donate uh, three open source uh, tools, toolkits um, uh, under the trusty AI uh, Peter to uh, Linux Foundation of AI. So we, can, we are hoping uh, the community can work with us uh, to make uh, AI more uh, robust and trustworthy and also more explainable and fair um, through uh, like open source uh, efforts and uh, uh, community collaboration. Uh, I also want to uh, acknowledge my uh, collaborators and the support uh, from my uh, management chain. Uh, I also support from different IBM groups uh, and our academic partners. Uh, they, they contribute uh, uh, greatly to uh, the research uh, works that we, I, I have covered um, in, in this tutorial. Um, so now I'm open the floors to uh, answer the questions uh, you may have. Thank you.